Welcome to Learning Photography with Duck. Here's your host, Duck. All right, hello everybody. Thank you for stopping by uh, to learn photography with Duck. I am Duck. Uh, a few things first. Uh, for those of you who may not have heard uh, or who are not part of the Harford County Amateurs Photography Group, uh, next, the 25th, what's next yes. Saturday? Saturday. Uh, Robert Fiedler and I are uh, hosting a walkabout in Norwich. It's an architectural walkabout where we're going to kind of hit some of the uh, um, historic sites in uh, two parts of the town. Uh, one around the old town green where the historical um, society has their offices right now. There's some uh, buildings that are uh, I think one of them is like from the 1600s or something like that. And of course, some, some newer ones. But uh, we're going to be shooting in around there. We're going to cut through uh, Norwich, old, uh, old Norwich Cemetery with some uh, headstones dating back to pre-Civil War. Uh, and then the later part of the day, we're going to be a little bit further south on Broadway, uh, where it's the old, uh, the the area where the the wealthy people of Norwich uh, built these uh, uh, very esteemed mansions, you know, back in the day that are still around. It's called Millionaire's Triangle. Uh, we're going to be photographing some of those uh, old homes there. Uh, and of course, there is St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, I mean, no, I'm sorry, St. Patrick's Church, which is located there. That's going to be uh, one of the f um, focal points of our event that day. So it's a full day event. Uh, we're meeting at 10 o'clock, going till about 3 o'clock. And if people feel up to it, we might even jump over to uh, Yantic Falls and Uncas Leap at Yantic Falls uh, to kind of close off the day. And then the next, the, the Monday following, which is going to be next Monday, I am hosting a very special uh, Zoom event for people who go with us to, you know, for the photo shoot, where we take the images that we take during the photo shoot, and I'm going to walk through my process of sorting and editing the images. So you'll be able to get a chance to literally follow the workflow from beginning to end. So if uh, if you don't have anything planned for the 25th, we invite you to join us. Uh, it's an outdoor event. Uh, and then uh, on that Monday, join me for that special online Zoom event. And, okay? Robert, is, and Robert is bringing cake. Robert. <laughs> okay, awesome. Are we, are we making a donation or is there a, a charge to it? Uh, it's a, uh, Robert said a $10 donation. Uh, it's going to be split up a little bit uh, where uh, a good portion of the proceeds are going to go to the Norwich Historical Society. So. And he has uh, he has a lot of knowledge of the area, so he's going to be sharing some of the history of of you know the uh, Norwich Town area and uh, Millionaire's Triangle and so on. So should we should we bring tripods and flash? Yes. Uh, well, flash no. Uh, it's tripods, it's yes. okay. all it's an outdoor event. Okay. Um, it's. It's all going to be listed in an itinerary that's going to be going out um, probably fairly soon. But to answer the question, yeah, um, <clears throat> we're looking to do this as a uh, fun workshop where you get to learn how to properly photograph some of these structures. So we'll be discussing things like uh, uh, angle of view and you know perspective and how to correct for certain perspectives in post 
that you may not be able to correct uh, in the field. Uh, so one of the things that we suggest is to bring a tripod uh, because one of the things we will be discussing is HDR photography um, depending on how the light situation is for us on the 25th. Uh, hopefully it's not too, too bad. Um, and of course, if, if you have a very tall tripod, the taller the better. Because if you can get your camera up high, that just makes these images so much better. And of course, if you have a high tripod, you might need to drag along a little folding stool. So it all depends on how hardy you feel and how uh, how much of a challenge you want to take on. What lens do you recommend we use? The widest you have. If you have something around a 24 millimeter, that'd be great. Uh, if all you have is a 50, go ahead and bring that. Um, there are techniques to get around having a shorter, uh, you know, I'm sorry, a longer focal length. But uh, yeah, if you have anything 100 or higher, uh, you're probably going to be struggling. Uh, do you recommend I bring my uh, uh, lens that opens out to 2.8? You're probably not going to need that. Uh, I mean, you can bring it. Just because you have 2.8 doesn't mean you have to use 2.8. Okay. Uh, that lens still has f8 and f11 and f16. <laughs> right. So, uh, uh, yeah, so there's there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, absolutely. This is a walking tour, so you don't want to be bogged down with too much equipment. I know that. That's why I'm trying to... That's, I, I want to bring only one lens, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Uh, in a case like this, I would probably bring my um, 18... My my regular 18 to 130, I guess 130, and uh, that goes to uh, 3.5, because that's the cheaper lens. I, I, I use the one that opens out only... When I need to, because uh, I don't want to take the chance of breaking my best lens if I don't have to. Oh, right. But I would also, I, if I really get desperate, and it doesn't cost much, and it doesn't take up much space in the bag, my 24 millimeter uh, 2.8 lens or 1.8 lens. Oh, I, I would. My husband. Well, he's going to carry everything. Oh, there you go. Your own alpaca. <laughs> <laughs> Your Sherpa. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah actually bill if if uh you usually travel with a little backpack anyway right yes so uh i would say uh put your 24 on your camera and and keep the uh 135 in in the backpack okay you know uh, in case you need it. The only reason I would suggest bringing anything as close to a 135 is if you want to get any particular uh, architectural details, you know. Um, otherwise, this is mainly about getting the whole structure in, in an image. Okay. So, uh, but uh, yeah. So what I normally do is I'll have, uh, I'll walk around with two lenses, once in the bag, ones on the on the camera all right uh let me go grab my tripod all right one of the things that they say not to do is to place your camera on the tripod then take the tripod and do this right all right actually let me grab let me grab a, a uh, I don't know what I do with my other camera. I had it out earlier. Yeah, I don't know what I do with it. Probably put it back in the cabinet. But anyhow, you have your camera here. They say, they say not to do this. Okay, because as you're walking along, if that latch lets loose, your camera's dropping to the ground, right? Okay. There is a solution for this. It's a little DIY solution that I did. Uh, I went to the uh, big box, uh, uh, you, um, big box store. You can go to like Lowe's or Home Depot, and I got a ring that fits around 
the neck of my tripod, all right, this ring, all right, and it just floats there. And attached to that is a lanyard with one of these clip hooks, okay? And this thing is just long enough that it clips to my camera where the strap is, okay? So this tethers my camera to my tripod. So should this let go for any chance whatsoever, that camera is only dropping to here, all right? And actually, if it's over my shoulder, it's just gonna drop to there and it's not gonna hit the ground, all right? So otherwise, I don't suggest walking around like this, la da dee da da, if you value your camera. Because if for any reason it lets go, it's gonna hit and it's gonna hit hard and you will break something. So uh, this kind of prevents that from happening. Okay. And what that does is it just, it makes it easier to carry a little bit more gear with you because it's distributed uh, across your body a little bit more. So you can have, you know, uh, one bag with a couple bottles of water, which are heavy in themselves, uh, a spare lens, spare battery, spare memory card, and then your working camera is always at the ready, already on its tripod, already with the legs extended so when you get to the next location you just open it up drop it down and you're good to shoot got it make sense all right so today is our general q and a and uh we started a little bit of a discussion uh bef you know while we were waiting for people to get in uh barbara bought herself uh, an AD200, a Godox AD200, which is a, a nice little light. I'm actually looking to purchase a couple of those lights myself uh, and getting away from my young Nuos because uh, the AD200s give me a little bit more power, uh, and, but they are still at a very, very portable size. So anyhow, uh, Barbara had the, uh, she started off uh, with a question about doing location shots and being able to place her lights uh, at these various locations. And she was asking about a portable C stand. And I kind of giggled to myself because there's no such thing as a portable C stand. Uh, C stands are very heavy. Uh, they're they're designed uh, they're designed to be a beast. Uh, you know you can literally hang an elephant off of them. That's what they're designed to do. They're not the best for location. If you have a young person to assist you, let them do the bull work, and then by all means bring bring a C stand. But they don't travel very well. I know. I've done it, okay? Um, so there's a trade-off, okay? If you want the, uh, the strength of a C-stand, then you have to kind of put up with the weight and the fact that they don't fold all that well, okay? They don't collapse to a small size, all right? However, the AD200 is a very, very lightweight light. Um, so, and what kind of modifier would you be putting on on that light, Barbara? That's that's one question I did not ask you. Um, so I have um, I have a, a pop up. Um, I think it's like a thirty six inch um, pop up that has a softbox. I have. Yeah, I have a. Okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's I think it's thirty six. Just a pop up one. It's, it's a nice, uh, you know, it's nice. That's a that's a large soft box. That's a large um, soft box. So it might be smaller than it might be smaller, but it's a 
It's not as big as this, no. This is a 36. Okay, so I have the, is the 24. 24? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, 24, 24 square, right? Yes, the 24 yeah. square. All right, and, so. Uh, yeah, I have a, a 24, like this size, like it's round. It's not a square. I have a round. I have two. It's like 24 by 24, something like that. Oh, like an octobox? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. All right, gotcha. All right, so, so those aren't very heavy themselves either you know um when you said 36 i'm like ooh 36 yeah maybe a c stand uh but for location work uh i travel with just regular light stands and these the light stands you know uh i don't have the the lightweight light stands i have the heavy duty light stands all right and what you need to look for with a location light stand, what I find, oh, I should say, what I find useful in a portable light stand for location work is you want something that will get to a 10 foot height yep. and that the legs will spread wide. Well, oh, that just sounds so dirty. Uh, because you want the stability, all right? When you are in a location environment, sometimes you don't know what you're going to be getting yourself into. If it's a windy environment, you you need the stability. You, the last thing you need is for that light stand to go over. Okay, so if you have the you know light stands that have a a large base, that's going to give you more stability. And of course, with this, you're going to need to carry sandbags. All right, that's definitely suggested. All right, uh, uh, and uh, I take it you probably don't work with an assistant. Uh, she's uh, she's doing something. Do you work with an assistant, Barbara? Um. So sometimes, sometimes I do, and sometimes I do not. So I recently uh, purchased these uh, KUPO Kupo. Oh, Kupo, yeah. So I purchased these where the center bar comes out. Yes. Where you can hold it. You can hold it. Right. Um, so those are very heavyweight for outdoor. They are. They're very heavy. So, but I also went and got um, some sandbags from. Um, I purchased these bags at Lowe's. That you and I took cat litter bags and put them in there, and they sit, they sit, they hold down, they hold down the the light stand. Right. So, yeah, and the bags are like easy to carry. If yes. I don't, yeah. Like, that's just, you know. Actually, I have. Uh, I I take it it's these type of bags. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Sandbags at Lowe's that um they, they they are much larger than that they're big and white and I yeah you, this is all you need now these are uh, double zippered yeah. okay and uh, what I actually do is I bought myself the the large freezer Ziploc bags yeah and I inserted a Ziploc I, I put the sand, well, actually, I didn't even put sand in here. I put gravel. Uh -huh. I put gravel in the Ziploc bag, zipped it, folded it over, and then inserted it just because the last thing you need is sand going all over your stuff. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so you need, you know, um, you have uh, two AD 200, so two light stands. Two sandbags, yeah. and then two modifiers. All right. So if you have two twenty fours, uh, or if you have a twenty four and maybe a beauty dish, that's pretty much that'll that'll pretty much cover just about anything. Yeah. You know. So that's that's a nice uh, travel um, lightweight travel kit. 
Uh, one thing I suggest is, you know, put everything in bags. It makes loading in and out so much easier. All right. Yeah. And uh, if you've got like a folding cart, that also helps. So, but anyhow, uh, you were talking about, you know, uh, setting up these lights uh, on a location for headshots. Right. All right. And, uh, you know, there there's two kinds of headshots that really you can take uh, on location. And one is a typical up against the white or colored background uh, in order to just fit wherever they want. And the other one is more like an environmental portrait where you look for some location uh, at the person's place of business and use that as a backdrop. Uh, and and location or um, environmental portraits are a little bit easier because now you have a little bit more leeway of what you can do uh, and you don't have to worry about you know, perfectly lighting that white background, all right? So uh, the key for environmental portraits, of course, is the light. Uh, most of the times you'll probably want to shoot something really early, early in the morning or later in the evening, which is usually when they're not available. <laughs> so... Early morning, you know, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning is, is a good time uh, before the sun starts, you know, uh, blazing across, you know, the uh, environment. And find something neutral in the background that doesn't look nasty and gross, all right? Um, depending on the type of, of business the person is in, you want to pick in a, a background that is appropriate to, for them. Uh, if it's a CEO, maybe in front of a corporate sign of some type. Mm -hmm. uh, but often in in some of these places, you can even find a blank wall. Uh, right. So you don't even need your pop up. You just light the black the the wall behind them, and you can still get your your uh, headshots on white. Yeah. Uh, the tricky part is anything that's reflective, windows. Uh, chrome, stainless steel, shiny metals, shiny plastics, uh, those you'll need to really worry about where you place your lights. But if you're doing anything outside, it's great because with your two ad 200s you actually have three lights. You have the sun, and then you have two lights that you can do whatever it is that you need, usually filling in shadow uh, on your subject. And maybe add a little bit of kicker behind them, uh, you know, either as a hair light, a little rim light on their shoulder, or to light up the background if it's a little bit too dark. So that gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, but yeah, C stands on location. Boy, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. That's tough. Uh, so hopefully that answers some of your questions that you may have about that. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, well, this is... Oh, Don, I didn't see you. When you when did you sneak in? <laughs> Don, how you been? Haven't seen you in a while. Here, I'm unmuted now. Yeah, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while, and I, I saw it on Facebook, so I said I'd stop in and check it out. Awesome, um, awesome. I see you're in San Francisco now. <laughs> I'm in San Francisco, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got a question for you on that Norwich thing. Uh, sure. Uh, it starts at 10 in the morning. 10 in the morning at Norwich? Correct. Whereabouts? Uh, it's, it's actually Norwich Town, Green, uh, the historical district. Uh, it's, uh, North. Near, near NFA, right? I'm sorry? In the area of NFA? That I'm not, I'm not overly familiar with, uh, with that area, but, uh, let me I see. Between the hospital and, and uh, North Free Academy. Oh, so you're going to be right Yes, the, yes. Uh, the, north, north of the Free Academy, yes. Okay, in that, in that public green where they got the cannon and everything? 
Uh, I did not see a cannon. Well, it's just a little bit, oh, I think it's south of uh, the hospital. I'm not sure. It might be. Let me, um, <laughs> let me pull up my notes from, from that. Uh, I actually have them. I, I plotted everything out on a map. Let's see. East, sta East Town Street. Yeah, it's the Norwich Historic District. It's where um, the Norwich Historical Society is. Uh, let's see. United Community and Family Services is down the street. Stop and Shop is down the street. Um, there's the Old Norwich Cemetery, which is here and here. Yeah. So Town Street, oops, zoomed out a little bit too much. Town Street comes down and I believe becomes Broadway. Yeah, becomes Broadway. So we'll be up in the north end. Uh, so if you know, if you know where Broadway is, uh, just follow that north till you come to the end and the green is literally right there. Is that Route 2 running uh, east to west there? Correct. Okay. So, so route as, route two, yeah, right. as, as so soon as you come to the end, you're going to take a left. Take a left. Okay. Yep. Right. Go to the end of that, and the green is literally right there. Got it. All okay. right. So we'll, we'll be spending uh, the morning there, and then we're going to come down uh, to Broadway in this area here, uh, which is... About a mile and a half south. It's really not that far, yeah. uh, and we'll spend the uh, the later part of the day there. And if anybody's interested, we can go to the casino. Uh, the, yes, um, <laughs> Yantic Falls, which is uh, right somewhere over here. Uh, Uncas Leap at Yantic Falls. Which is, uh, I don't know, somewhere. So anyhow, that's that's where we're going to be. Uh, I sent an itinerary to Robert for him to look over. And that will be sent out to uh, the people who are signed up. So, but um, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to it. Uh, he and I did some scouting there. Uh, month and a half ago or so. And uh, we kind of scoped out all the areas that we want to hit. Uh, and it's a fairly easy walk. It's nothing strenuous. Uh, the, uh, the upper loop is roughly about a half a mile total. Okay, but because we're going to be making so many stops, it's going to, you know, take up a, a couple of hours. And then the lower section is even shorter. Uh, it's about a thousand feet from beginning to end, uh, but it's right across the street from St. Patrick's Church. And let me tell you, this, look at that. Is that gorgeous or what? Uh, this was taken from a little park across the street from the church where we're actually going to be having lunch. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. So. Yes, yeah, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, requested that everybody bring a bag lunch with them, simply because there's really no place to sit down and eat in the area, uh, unless we go, you know, further south or f back up north. Uh, but that's just a lot of shuffling around, so we figure we'll make it easy. Uh, it's a nice little green. It's, um, as you can tell, there's a lot of uh, trees that provide, you know, a lot of shade in the area. So it's, it's going to be nice and cool. And, uh, um, it's, it overlooks the church, which after lunch, that's going to be, you know, our principal focal point before hitting some of the mansions. So. Uh, just look at the weather. Saturday looks good. 66 to 85. 
Oh, good. Awesome. And partly body, so it has to Oh, that's even better. That's even better. Yeah. But I prefer it to be uh, partly cloudy. Yeah. 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 But that could change. It's a week away. <laughs> Please. Away, so that's what the uh, best guess is right now. <laughs> Let me tell you, I was, I was telling a story earlier how I was woken up at 4 o'clock in the morning by my wife to tell me that it was raining outside and I had to go put the doors back on my Jeep. <laughs> in the rain, in the dark. It was not pleasant. So, anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Could be Sure. Uh, to experiment with either affinity or lubapro. Okay. Confusion, rather. Uh, you got anything? Uh, I have a, a, I have affinity. affinity. For the iPad. It's not for a, a, a computer. For the iPad. Right. The program, um, well, I can't speak on Luminar. Luminar, you said, right? Yeah, I I can't really speak too much on Luminar. I've only played with it a little bit, uh, not a lot. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I can say, anything that is designed for a tablet platform tends to be a fairly stripped down version of whatever you can find for a desktop. So in order to be able to play with the, the you know, the um, reduced computing power that a tablet has and the reduced memory that a tablet has, all right? So you're going to be uh, bridled right off the get-go with a lot of things that you can do. So it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish by editing mobily. All right. As compared to waiting until you get home to be able to edit on a full fledged desktop, you know, uh, yeah. me personally, uh, I've gone to a point in my photography where I'm starting to push myself a little bit more that than what a tablet can can provide. So for me, uh, a tablet doesn't doesn't give me what I would require in an editing program, all right? Simply because I'm experimenting with a lot more. Yeah, I, I, I even went and got the uh, uh, Photoshop for iPad, and it is totally different. You can't even do layers with it. You can't do a lot of stuff. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it won't do, it won't do uh, Adobe Camera Raw. It won't do ACR. No. So you can't import anything in and work on it. You can only take a, a JPEG. Yes. And bring it in and play with a JPEG, which is really, you know. Yeah, at, at at that point, why even bother? Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, however, you know, uh, Lightroom for mobile, you know, uh, has a lot more options than the, the Photoshop does right now. Uh, eventually, you know, things are going to change. Eventually, these mobile devices will get to the point where they're strong enough to handle a full-fledged, uh, you know, program like Photoshop, but we're not there yet. All right. So you just have to analyze what, what is it in your workflow that you're trying to accomplish uh, when you're on the scene uh, and then, you know, uh, find something that can handle it for that part and then finish it when you're back. Um, as far as affinity products go, uh, well, let me let me explain why I even bothered with affinity to begin with. My background is commercial graphic design, and I've used a lot of design programs in the past. And one of my all-time favorites has been CorelDRAW. Now, CorelDRAW comes as a package with CorelDRAW, Corel Photo, and a few other little things. Kind of the same way Adobe has 
uh, Photoshop, it has uh, Illustrator and all those. Okay. But <clears throat> I've always liked Corel Draw over Illustrator because it was a little bit more intuitive for me. However, Corel pissed me off. <laughs> I guess the best way they can say it. Uh, they stopped developing uh, Corel Draw for the Mac back when I was on a Mac, uh, which kind of sucked uh, and was one of the reasons why I went back to PC, uh, to Windows. All right. And then uh, they were not really developing the program uh, very much. And other programs were just blowing them out of the water. All right. So I was looking to get away from Corel Draw, but I need something. I needed something with the power that Corel Draw had. And I tried Illustrator. I just couldn't wrap my head around the way Illustrator does a lot of the same things that Corel Draw does, but in a funky, weird, unusual way. I couldn't wrap my head. So I decided I'm going to try this new program called Affinity Designer. And I liked it. The only problem is it's not a full-fledged, robust design program. The same thing with Affinity Photo. It's a basic editor. You can do a lot. Well, it's actually a little bit more than a basic editor. You can do a lot with Affinity Photo. But it does not have the rounded uh, uh, tools that Photoshop does. Photoshop has decades behind them in developing a lot of these tools and making them better. All right. Affinity is a startup trying to compete with Adobe. They're just not there yet. Okay. So while I like Affinity products, I use Affinity products all the time. I'm actually developing a set of um, uh, photo hunt cards in Affinity. Uh, but I still do a lot of my, my photo work in Photoshop before bringing it into Affinity because Affinity just doesn't have as robust a tool set, you know. So, uh, again, uh, it depends on what your needs are. A lot of it, if, if you do not need the full power of Photoshop and don't want to get into the expense of Photoshop, then I would probably say go with uh, Affinity as a solution because, in my opinion, Affinity is probably a little bit better than anything else that's out there. All right. And there's uh, there's all kinds of stuff, even down to to freeware like GIMP, you know, but GIMP fails in so many ways across so many levels uh, that it's it, it, I wouldn't even consider it a competitor to to Photoshop. Uh, the, only, the only thing that I've had, I just got it. I just got an iPad Pro uh, and I have my big Mac, uh, iMac so I can do my stuff on Photoshop and everything else on the iMac. But I just wanted this to play with it a little bit. Yeah. And uh, to me, it's like trying to learn French or Spanish after you know Italian. You know, yeah, the yeah. same stuff is there. They have nouns and verbs, but they're in different places. And it's trying to learn a whole new language. Yeah. If there, if there was a convention where everything was the same, the same tools in the same place, it would be great. But it's not. You have to do things a little different. It's not as intuitive as I thought it no, would be. No, it's not. And uh, I'm just very disappointed in it. And I know a lot of people that are raving about it. You go on YouTube and look. They just think yeah. it's the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, and I would venture that they are not professional photo editors. Probably not. You know? Uh, but Affinity, you got to realize, Affinity was built specifically for cross-platform use so it was right from the get-go their their goal was to make a program that was for windows for macs for linux 
for desktops, for tablets, all right? Uh, so there's a lot of things that you cannot have when you're, when, when that's such a broad target that, that you want to accomplish. It just, it's not doable. The other thing is that they are building it from scratch. All right. Meaning that they, they just designed the code right from, from the get go. So they haven't been able to work out all the bugs the same way that Adobe has because Adobe has the history of having worked out all those bugs. They fine tune their coding to the point where, you know, uh, we, we have a very fast program that is probably, uh, it's not even as bloated as they, as it used to be. I mean, file wise, size wise, you know, uh, Adobe products were these monsters that took up a lot of memory. All right. Uh, they've been able to balance that out. If you've noticed the, the interface in a lot of the Adobe products are now HTML based. They're not based on the operating OS. All right. Um, uh, so that, you know, affords them the, the compatibility across platforms, but it also helps reduce the file size because HTML is such a, a streamlined uh, interface. It's a, it's a streamlined UI interface, you know. So I got to give, you know, mad props to Adobe for, for moving in that direction to, when they did. It pissed off a lot of people. They were wondering, what the hell is Adobe doing to us, all right? But hopefully people can now realize that, hey, you know, they back then they were well ahead of the game and look at what they're doing now, you know. The only thing I have to a gig against uh, Adobe is their RAM hogs. They just eat up RAM. Well, you're going to get that with any any uh, image editor. Anyone, yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's just colossal. I just watch the numbers go down. Yeah. You know, every time you make another layer, you open up something else, it just chews up the RAM. Yeah, you, know, you have to eventually start clearing it out. Just it slows it down. So yeah, fast. yeah. Well, I've it's got all the RAM in it too, but it still chews it up. Yeah, it's where you need it is in your video card. Yeah, uh, that's where that's where you got to put your money in. It's the video card. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So get as much video memory as possible then. Yeah, if you can get you know a a really powerful video card, you're gonna see a tremendous improvement uh in in uh in um uh, speed yeah the bad rap with mac and I, i'm a mac guy so you you get a choice of one or two to take it or leave it <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah 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 so that's a killer but uh, they try to keep up with it they use the radeon cards and stuff so they're pretty quick oh that's good yeah yeah my uh i have uh, i had a love-hate relationship with mac back in the day I had a uh, a MacBook Pro. It was a 17 inch. All right, so we're talking uh, some while back. All right, and I, I loved the machine. It was it was great. It could handle anything. And this was when uh, Lightroom three. I was using Lightroom three on it. Okay. So this was uh this was before they got into the subscription thing. All right. So on it I had all my Corel programs because at that time Corel was still developing for Mac and I loaded Lightroom 3. And of course uh I bought myself a new camera that was not supported by Lightroom 3. So I had to upgrade to Lightroom 4. No problem. I needed to do it anyway. Bought Lightroom 4, went to install it, told me the OS cannot handle Lightroom 4. I would have to upgrade my OS. No big deal. I was on Leopard, so this tells you, okay. you know, way yeah, back I, when. Yep, yeah, I got one of those. All right. So I had to up, upgrade to Mountain Lion. All right. And... The nice thing about Mac back then 
which Windows stand is you can get the upgrades for free. Still can. Uh, still can, yeah. Where, you know, back then Windows was charging you. All right. So I says, oh, no problem. I ordered myself the upgrade, stuck the disc in, went to upgrade. It says, oh, sorry, your machine cannot handle the program. <laughs> oh, son of a bitch. All right. So I, I closed it up. I went down to the Mac store in New Haven. I walked in. Found a first pimple-faced kid with a shirt and says, "This is what I need. I need a MacBook Pro with a 15 or with a 17-inch screen. With I don't want Retina because I hate the Retina thing. All right, hurts my eyes, and it has to have a CD drive. Uh, well, sir, unfortunately." We don't have 17 inch screens anymore. It's either 13 or 15. And they all come with Retina. You can't get anything other than Retina. And we're no longer putting CD drives into these machines. Really? Oh. So I, I packed it up, and went back to Windows. <laughs> well, I got the Retina and I don't have the CD drive. I got an external CD drive. And the new the new machines are coming out with a new chip in it, which will just change everything. Because who knows what's going to happen with that stuff as far as compatibility, yeah, and everything else. So yeah, and and you know that's actually one of the the good things that I'm glad I changed is because after that I started hearing all these complaints about you know proprietary cables and and uh, dongles and uh, you know I didn't want to deal with that. And so I'm I'm glad to step away from Mac. You know, if you guys have Macs, God bless you. You can keep them. <laughs> yeah, I'm still using it. Yeah, but, but, yeah, I have, I have my custom built PC. This PC is about 12 years old. And it's still blazing fast. Still blazing fast. So, so anyhow, that's that's my little soapbox rant on on Max. Sorry, <laughs> but but it it goes to illustrate how you know technology changes, and we just kind of have to you know roll with the punches. Um, you know things things move forward. I mean, look at what's happening with digital cameras now. Uh, there's this this whole movement to get away from the mirror mirrored cameras to mirrorless cameras and you know everybody that grew up with uh, DSLRs they they were fighting at tooth and nail but as soon as they switch over to a mirrorless they go oh my god this is fantastic where has this been all my life <laughs> so it just goes to show right one problem is if you've invested money in your lenses and even if you go with a Canon, the adapter costs a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. That's why I'm not going to switch. However, however, I am going to ride that wave of people selling off all their old DSLR stuff. And I'll pick up myself some decent equipment at half the price. Mm -hmm. You know? Because I know there are gearheads out there that, oh, I don't want the DSLR anymore. I need to get that new, you know, R6. The R5 is so yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I had that conversation with somebody this morning. She said she does not believe in buying the latest and greatest. What it be you have to stay with it? Yeah, absolutely. My first camera was a Pentax K1000. Fantastic camera. I bought that camera in, I want to say, 79. All right? And that camera lasted me. Well, I, I eventually bought an, uh, a Canon A1 that kind of replaced it. But I still held on to it. Uh, so I, I had both. 
I, I bought my first Canon in 82. And I used that one body and I had like three lenses. That one body and three lenses, actually two bodies because I, I ended up buying a second one, with a motor drive from 82 to 2004. One, one body for all those years. And it served me well, you know. Nowadays, you know, every every five years, people are buying new, buying new, buying new, you know. So it's, we're getting into this disposable society, you know, unfortunately. My 11-year-old rebel is my workforce. Mm -hmm. Because when I go hiking or biking, I'm not going to take the, uh, the good camera. Yeah, and and it's and it's good enough. Ten ten megapixels is all I need because they they are for the meetup pages or for Facebook or or, mm -hmm. or email. My first commercial job uh, with a digital camera, I did with a six megapixel. Kodak Easy Share. Commercial commercial job. Paid client paying cash. It was a jeweler. I did it with a six megapixel Easy Share. You know? Uh it, not the best camera to use for a commercial job, but that's all I had at the time. Alright, and then I switched over to my my first DSLR was a digital DSLR. Uh, was a, the Canon 40D, you know, and um, uh, let me tell you, I used the, uh, I used the 40D for a while, all right, and that was 10 megapixels. Then I went and bought a 7D, which was uh, 12 megapixels. And I did a job where they printed billboard size with that camera. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's not about having 40 megapixels, 50 megapixels, you know. There was hey, my... Watch it. Watch it. What's I that? Got 42. I've got 42 on my Sony. Watch it. <laughs> Well, here's here's something. In Wallingford one day, I went to get coffee. This is across the street from the Episcopal Church. I forget the name of the coffee place. But there was a guy taking a picture of the church. So I went over to look at his gear, and he had a Rebel, and he had an expensive lens. And he said, as long as you have a good lens, the camera body, eh, who cares? And he let me look for his lens, and it, wow, yeah. it really looked good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it's all in the glass. A cheap glass is going to give you all kinds of, of problems, chromatic aberrations, uh, uh, vignetting in the corners, uh, you know, uh, lens barreling, you know, all kinds of good stuff. Soft focus, okay, variable variable apertures, all kinds of problems. But um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, uh, there's there's nothing wrong with having good gear, all right? So, yeah, I, I've been... Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not really knocking your 42 megapixel Sony. I'm not, <laughs> honestly. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes I wish I had a little bit more uh, uh, pixel power, all right? Or as they say, it isn't. I can't say it. It's, it's not. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's it high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was too dirty to tell. <laughs> yeah. it's what you do with it. It isn't. It's not the size of the equipment. It's how you yes, use it. That's. <laughs> yeah. We're talking cameras. But you know, all right. So, if we take a lesson from, let's say, filmmakers, all right, who shoot 4K, all right. Now, of course, the biggest thing is 6K and 8K. All right. And for those of you who don't understand what 2K, 4K, uh, 8K means, uh, 4K is, is literally 4,000 pixels. All right. 
uh, uh, cross dimension image size. Okay. There are no displays on the market, really, uh, unless you want to shell out the cash that, that displays that. These screens that you're looking at, the television that you watch your programs are all 1080p. All right. They're a, like a third of the quality. But what 4K allows them to do is it allows them to shoot with extra space and be able to crop in without loss of quality. All right. And that's what some of these uh, cameras with, with, you know, denser pixel depth allows you to crop in without losing too much quality, as long as you have a good lens, obviously. All right. But it's great for people who do uh, nature work, uh, you know, uh, birders, uh, wildlife photographers. All right. Because one, you, you need to rely very heavily on the glass in order to get your subject closer to you. But if you have the pixel depth where you can crop in without sacrificing too much of the quality, oh my God, that's, that's a deal changer, you know? But of course, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna pay good bucks for that. Although, it, you know, prices are dropping down. Now, they, it used to be that there was a trade-off when you start getting into these heavier pixel depths that the trade-off was that the pixel size was smaller. Therefore, you weren't getting the same light quality. All right? So they developed these ISO variant uh, sensors which in my opinion, most sensors were ISO variant right from the beginning anyway. But, you know, now they can, you know, they, they set the ISO at 100, but they can set the ISO at whatever they want. Uh, you know, it's just that they lock it. And of course, the, the, the deeper the pixel depth is, they can boost the signal artificially and, you know, what what was ISO 100 to a a uh, 12 megapixel sensor? If we were to you know switch it over and, and keep the specs, that would be more like an 800 ISO sensor that they just drop it down to being a hundred. I don't know if that made sense to you guys. All right, so they're flubbing the numbers to begin with, you know. Because they can, it's it's an electro, you know, it's a um, um, photoelectric sensor. So all it's doing is receiving energy, and then they can convert it to whatever signal they want, you know. Um, so yeah, the 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 pixel depth, but then you get into you know these uh, cell phone cameras, all right that if you look at the chip that's in them, they're, you know, a quarter of an inch across and they have, you know, it's a 16 megapixel chip. Holy cow. Imagine the pixel density on that thing. We're talking about quantum mechanics in this case, you know. Uh, and of course, you know, you look at the image quality coming from, you know, the latest iPhone 40. You know, it blows your mind what what uh, what they can do, but what people don't realize is a lot of that is done in software. You know, so anyhow, I I hope I didn't bo um, bore you with my little tirade there. Hopefully, there was some educational aspect to it. Uh, anybody got a serious question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Look, I, I have a serious question. I can share my screen. Now go for it. Okay. Nice, clean desktop. That's what I like to see. 
That's because of your lecture last week. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we are. Uh, okay, I've just started playing with the adjustment brush. I really don't need to use it, this picture. Uh, one thing I like to do, watch me duck, mm -hmm. is let's say I want the grass green. I will sometimes change the, the luminance of the grass. You know, I, I like it a little darker sometimes. The other thing I will also do is I don't like yellow within the grass, so I will make my global change of making the yellow darker. So right. you can see that the grass is more green. But sometimes I run into other situations where I can't do this. So let me come to here. I want to, let's say I want to use the adjustment brush. Right. Uh, I've learned how to use the adjustment brush for, let's just say I want to do something here, and I'm not going to really do that. Yeah, right yeah. Now. Let's just say I want to do something here. Let me erase just a little something. Okay. Uh, I know you can do this in Lightroom, but I don't see where I can use uh, uh, hue, saturation, and luminance in Adobe Camera Raw when you're doing um, adjustment brush. Okay. Did you up update your ACR? Because it doesn't look like the latest version. No, it's not. I I buy, I go to these computer shows and I buy these cheap versions of older software. Okay. So I'm not using the latest and greatest. I'm using, a, it's, it's, a 19, it's a 2019 version. Okay. All right. So, uh, all right. Do me a favor. Yes. All right. Uh, turn off the overlay on, on that bush. Uh, on it's always... No, nope, not right right next to it where it says overlay. R right next to the where it says mask down at the bottom. Okay, turn off the overlay. Yep, turn off the overlay. All right. That way we don't have that uh uh Oh. Wait a minute. Oh, the mask. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought yeah. Uh overlay is on. Now the overlay is off. Yeah, take and then take the mask off. Okay. There we go. All right, so you want to take this deep burgundy bush and you want to do what with it? Uh, let's Just for the sake of argument, I want to change the luminance and make it lighter. Okay. Uh, well, at this point, uh, you would have to work with uh, your uh, exposure. All right, maybe open up your shadows a little bit. Uh, but any kind of, of color control, uh, you're, you're, you're limited to temperature tint. And uh, uh, to a certain extent, you can play around with saturation. Okay. Because whenever you, you do anything extreme with exposure, mm -hmm. all right, uh, you are going to... Uh, um, change the saturation on it all right and i should probably let's see yeah but but lightroom has hs has an hsl tab but adobe camera raw doesn't correct they changed that with the latest version i was going to say the new version has that yeah the new version of uh of uh, photoshop of acr okay good yeah. acr i meant to say okay yeah Maybe I should bite the bullet and subscribe. Well, actually, let me see. I'm surprised. Uh, uh, so it's just in the local adjustment brushes that uh, that you don't have access to them, huh? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's... I could always, I could always do this in Lightroom and then put it into Photoshop. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually... If you have Lightroom and you use Lightroom, uh, I would suggest do all your raw editing in Lightroom. Okay. You know, 
uh, simply because it's a little bit more robust than this older version of ACR. Okay. All right. So, so my workflow tends to be uh, whatever I can do in Lightroom, simply because uh, with, with Lightroom, I'm dealing with sliders. I'm not dealing with layers. Okay. All right. So dealing with sliders is easier to keep track of than dealing with layers. All I got to do is glance off to my right and I can see where all the sliders are and know at a very quick glance what each one of those sliders is doing. Okay. When it comes to Photoshop, if I glance over, all I see is a stack of layers and I would have to rely on my memory of what each one of those layers was doing. Okay, so for me, Lightroom is a little bit easier uh, to to understand when I'm making all these global changes. All right, and in your particular case, because uh, you have more abilities using Lightroom than this particular version of ACR, it doesn't make sense to use ACR if Lightroom, which is also ACR, has better tools, okay. you know? So my workflow is I start in Lightroom, I do all my global edits, all right? I do some local edits, all right? And, and I, I, I'm very minimal with my local edits because if you if you do too much, with the local edits in Lightroom, it, stand, it tends to start bogging down. Lightroom was not designed for that kind of work. Okay? So what I do is I, I, I do whatever I can in Lightroom. Then if there is something that Lightroom cannot do, I will transfer over to Photoshop, do whatever I, I need to, to do in Photoshop, save it, come back to Lightroom, and finish my workflow there. At that point, I can, uh, I usually, that means recropping to my final size and using my export presets to send the image to wherever it needs to go. All right. Uh, so that's, that's what I would suggest to you, uh, simply because you got an older version, you know. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with this particular version because it will still do what you need it to do. All right. Just take advantage of your particular setup. Take advantage of Lightroom uh, and, and the fact that now Lightroom, your version of Lightroom, is a better ACR program than Photoshop ACR. Okay. So. Yes, sir. There are quite a few good YouTube videos on the new ACR that explain all the different capabilities now. Yes. They're very quick, they're very short. Yeah. 10, 20 minutes. And they really cover the whole gamut of what the new version does. Yeah. And it's quite a bit. It's it it is. is. Yeah. Good. This this particular upgrade that they did, they actually they did so much on the back end that it's not even funny. Uh, what they did, you know, with, with the uh, ACR engine itself, you know, uh, that I noticed a significant difference between the old ACR and the current ACR performance-wise. Not, not, not just the UI, but actual performance. It was like night and day, you know. Um, but uh, again, they're working towards that cross-platform compatibility, uh, uh, cross-device compatibility, you know, down the road, okay? And they're trying to make Lightroom and Photoshop ACR look a little bit more uh, cohesive so that when you go from one to the other, it's not like, you know, going from the moon to Mars, you know, which a lot of people were complaining about. So I'm glad to see that they actually did it, you know, uh, work towards that. And I think the new interface is a lot better than the old interface. 
that uh, Bill just showed. It's a little bit more intuitive. So, but uh, uh, Bill, your version of Lightroom is is also an older version, I take it, or yes, okay. like I said, I go to these computer shows yeah. where you can yeah. buy computer. Uh, like I paid forty dollars for Lightroom and forty dollars mm -hmm. for for uh, uh, Photoshop, and it's uh, and uh, my version for each is. Uh, 2019 the 2019 oh. version yeah so yeah absolutely mm -hmm. you know there was a time when i would buy a piece of software and i would use it for about three years before i needed to upgrade that's what i had been doing with photoshop yeah. i originally i used to use photoshop elements and i was getting a new version every third version i got nine then mm -hmm. 12 then mm -hmm. 15 yeah and there's nothing wrong with it because they still do exactly what you need to do. Right. You know? It's just as every so often I have to do something yeah. special, which isn't that often. Yeah. But, you know, back, back in the day, uh, I remember spending $1,800 for, uh, for the suite, the Adobe suite, uh, which back then was... Um, Photoshop, Illustrator, and um, in uh, a, a, an earlier version of like InDesign, I think it was, you know. But eighteen hundred dollars at a at a pop, you know. And uh, when I was young, I I couldn't afford it, you know. So I would save and save and save, and and you bet your ass I would abuse that piece of software until you know. <laughs> I had saved up a, a lot more f for the next version, which, like you, would have been three generations down the road. Something uh, I bought at a computer show, and I haven't used it yet. I tried it, but there were a lot of modules to it. What's the one that... Is her name Heather? Uh, she moved. She pushes it. It's third party, and I'm going through my disks. Um, That is. Um, keep talking. I'll find yeah, it. there, there's so many people uh, making add-ons for for Photoshop. It's not even funny. I use Nick. I like Nick tools. Oh, I've kept that. Yeah. Luckily, I I got it when uh, Google had it for free. Now it's owned by somebody else. You have to pay sixty nine. If my version ever died, I would still go out and pay the sixty nine bucks. Because it's worth it. There are a couple of filters I use. I use the polarizing filter. I use the tonal contrast. And mm -hmm. I use a couple of other things. And what I was trying to think of, I have it here, Topaz. Oh, Topaz. Yeah, Topaz. yeah, yeah. Topaz. Uh, this disc comes with Topaz Adjust. Black and white, clarity, clean. Yeah. Uh, well, to Topaz, things. you can buy as a standalone. Detail and focus. Mm-hmm. I thought I've seen ads for Topaz AI, which is not one of these, but I yeah. tried playing with this and I, it's like, it's too much of a learning curve to think of. So that's why I just stick with the neck there. I know what I want and I just go with right. what I want. Yeah. And Topaz, Topaz has a lot of different modules as well. Uh, yes. I've got the whole series of Topaz along with Luminar and 4. Did I lose your voice? No. Are, are you talking, Doc? Uh, no, Alan is. Hold on, maybe maybe because I pressed this button. <laughs> but anyway, I've got, I've got all, Yeah, I've Alan got is talking. I've got all the um, Topaz on standalones and use Luminar, so I'm just getting started with Photoshop and, and then Lightroom. Like like the um, the cataloging for Lightroom, but other than that, I'm still using Edit by, Lum Edit by Luminar. Um, yeah. Yeah, see, yeah, because you have to understand, all right, we have Adobe that has its proprietary code of how it renders certain colors and, and manipulates the tones, okay? And then we have Luminar that has its own proprietary set of code for manipulating color and, and tone its own way. 
And the same way with topaz, the same way with affinity. All right. So while they all manipulate color and tones on, on the three channels, and even though they all may say clarity, okay, mathematically, they're handling it in, in totally different ways. So you're going to get very different results. So what it comes down to is what is your artistic preference? All right. What results do you like from, you know, this particular piece of software in relation to this piece of software? All right. There's a lot of people that, that live and die by Topaz tools because it gives them a look that Photoshop cannot do. I'm not really a realistic type person. So that's why Topaz comes in great. Mm -hmm. you know, um, with the different painterly uh, type effects um, and, what, and what have you. Uh, with the different looks. Um, you know, you know uh, the Paul Turbine analogy would be like the you old know, Fujichrome film and E6 and all the other ones. Each one leaned toward a different color. Yes. And I think Fuji mm -hmm. went to green and Kodak went to you know, uh, went to blues. The blues, like yes. It's, it's basically the same thing, uh, you know, how it's developed and stuff like that. The old film guys here, so we're starting to date ourselves. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, absolutely true. You know, and uh, all right, if, if we go back to the film days, uh, I knew a photographer that only shot chromes. He would not shoot negatives. Because he did not like the look of negatives. Everything was shot chromes. He loved the richer, uh, saturated colors that, ro that chromes gave him. But he had a narrower, uh, working, uh, um, uh, latitude with his exposure, you know, but he was a studio photographer, so he didn't care, you know, um, but, uh, oh, uh, and, uh, I heard a, a, another guy that I, I didn't know him personally. I, I knew of him, uh, shot landscapes with chromes only because he loved that saturation that, that chromes gave him, you know, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's finding the tool that accomplishes the look that you want to get. All right. The problem is, you know, a lot of beginners, they don't know what they want. They haven't developed a look. They haven't developed a style. So, you know, you're going to experiment with everything. And at that point, what speaks to you? All right. When you look at, at the end results, do you like A better or do you like B better? Well, if you like B, go with B. Do what gave you B, you know. And it doesn't matter if I'm constantly pushing Lightroom, you know. <laughs> Because I'm a Lightroom guy, you know. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with my results with Lightroom, you know. But uh, go your own way. So, uh, anyhow. Us us old film guys. Alan, you're an old film guy too, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, did, did weddings back in the 70s and 80s. Oh, God, that's something I'll never do. I mean, you had to hear we've only just begun every time you went to work. <laughs> let, let me tell you, in the early 90s, my first wife and I uh, had a DJ business. And we did weddings. And we played, we've only just begun at every fucking wedding. Excuse the French. All right. <laughs> well, weddings... Uh... That's what my joke is. I'm glad I didn't get married to the 80s because we didn't have that. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, by, by, 19, by 1982, that was uh, an overused song. Uh, uh, for, for me, it was uh, um, the electric slide and uh, Mac Macarena. Macarena. Well, there were every, 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 every single event, sometimes twice. But... <laughs> But at, 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 at that time, you know, even though I was a, a DJ, I was watching the photographers working their butts off 
they would be there from the morning until well after, you know, we packed up our DJ equipment. When we were packing up, they were packing up too. So they they put in these long, long hours, you know. And uh, I saw what they went through. And so early, early on, I said, uh uh-uh, that is not for me. And I, I would, I never had that urge to try, uh, wedding photography. I did have a friend that corralled me into doing her daughter's wedding reluctantly. They literally didn't have two nickels to rub together. So I, that was my wedding gift to them. And I'm like, I did not enjoy it. I, I was not having fun with my camera and I want to have fun with my camera. So for those of you who enjoy doing weddings, bless you. I got some. You take them. Somebody had to do it. I enjoy doing it. Somebody de- definitely has I, I to do it. Close to, about, close to 18 years on that. Yeah. I'd rather, I'd rather stick with my non-moving, non-complaining uh, little trinkets that I have to put on my table to shoot. I'm happy with that. You know what I was all set to? I'll do that all day. Well, I, I was all set to last fall. Alan and Sue, Sue, Sue Fenton were, um, had an exhibit together in Hartford. Do you remember that, Alan? Uh, yeah, uh, Open Studio Hartford. Open Studio. And the two of you showed me how you present your photos for sale. And Sue showed me her method which was the easiest thing to do, I thought, not having Matt, because let the person decide if they want a Matt yeah. or whatever. And I was all set for this year to start doing that. And then yeah. this COVID happened. And yeah. the reason why I decided to go that route with my photography was I never made enough money with event photography. To, I made just enough to to pay for the advertising in these little papers. Mm-hmm. And I was going to do real estate photography and then found out that... They don't pay. pay. They don't pay. They're the cheapest people on the earth. No, they want to pay only a hundred bucks. And it's like, that's not, that's not worth it. First of all, I would have to get insurance because I'm not going into somebody's home and accidentally break something. Yep. So, you know, I talked to Alan, I talked to Sue and I made up my mind to do this mainly because I don't have to deal with a client saying, oh, do this. No, you did that wrong. Either yeah. you buy what I have <laughs> or you don't buy it. Yeah. We're both happy. And then this happened. Yeah, but you have to be a salesman for, for that kind of uh, um, outlet. Hey, Bill, we'll talk on Saturday. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So, yeah, I uh, my, my wife's been tinkering with the idea of me selling some of my my photography and i have no desire you know so i told her hey if you want to give it a go i'll you know i'll process them i'll i'll get them ready for print and you just handle the rest you know sell them uh at the little you know um the uh arts and crafts shows that pop up every summer you know it'll give her something to do with her friend you know but uh, I I I hate sales. I am not a good salesperson, so that wouldn't be for me. And I did well. I did as a rule. I'm not a good salesperson, but I did one season at J.C. Penney Portraits, and I did well with sales. Um, probably because it's a product that I believed in photography. I tried yeah. selling. A, you know, you remember that woman I brought to. Um, the waterfall that time she had a business and i tried to sell her stuff it was diet food and i couldn't know but i couldn't sell it to save my life yeah yeah well what the nice thing with jc penny is that they had a structured workflow that all you had to do was follow it oh yeah you know when you're when you're in it for yourself uh there's no blueprint you have to make that blueprint yes. you know so um and that's a whole other set of rules for uh, selling artwork, you know. And there's different levels, you know. And the higher you go up in the level, 
the more competitive and cutthroat it becomes, you know? So it's like, at, at what point do you want to, you know, find yourself at? What level do you want to find yourself at? You know? I mean, look at um, Peter Lick. You know, he commands tens of thousands of dollars for his for his images. But uh, look at the gruff he takes, you know. Oh, we're not talking. We're not talking big money here. We're no, I, I understand. But, you know, I'm just using him as an example of, you know, top tier uh, yeah. art photographer, you know. Um, it's it's uh, it's big business. And it's, you know, you have to have thick skin to do it and you have to be very cutthroat to do it you know um there are people that are very happy going to you know art shows uh you know popping up their tent uh, uh at all these little you know um um weekend events throughout the the state and selling it you know that way uh and augmenting their set i would suggest always augment it with some kind of online sales outlet so you know that way in case you can't make that direct sale on location you give them okay. something that they can you know follow up later you know that way they get home and it goes oh man you know i should have bought it mm -hmm. all right so you got their business card it says oh I can get it right off of his website. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. You know? You ought to let Diane do uh, sell your photos. If she wants to do it, and if you don't, just do what you want to do. Let her do what she would like to do. Yeah, uh, she, she, She's not going to do it. Okay. It's all talk for her right now. Oh, it's all talk? Yeah. All right. Yeah. It just sounds like something she would enjoy. And she probably would. Mm -hmm. She probably would. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't think she realizes the work that's involved. Yeah. You know, that's that's why I, I know it's pretty much all talk. You know, so. Hey, Doug, I have to head out. Um, I will see you Saturday morning. Awesome. Good to see you, Don. Yeah, good to see you, Bill and Doug. Don, see you later. And uh, I'll see you Saturday. All right. Bye. Take care. All right, and uh, anybody else have any other questions that uh, they need answered? Otherwise, you know, we can probably close it up. Yeah, thank you very much again. Um, thank you, Dad. We'll see you on, on Saturday as well. So. Awesome. Good, yes. good. Yeah. So, yeah, stay, uh, yeah. keep keep a lookout for the, uh, the handout that's going to be, you know, uh, I think Robert's probably going to send it out little itinerary, kind of explaining everything that's going to happen during the day, what to bring, what to expect, the whole nine yards. So, okay. Great. See you Saturday. All righty. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Bye. Right. Be Thank safe you. in the meantime. Thank you for watching Learning Photography with Duck. Brought to you in association with Milford Photo, your local full-service camera store. Located in downtown Milford, Connecticut, Milford Photo offers you a personalized shopping experience. From the latest camera gear to printing and framing services. And, of course, educational workshops to teach you the finer aspects of photography. Don't forget to tell them Duck sent you.